Hi, how are you? Good, I hope. I've been reading a book, one of many, but very well written, that has really got me in a tizzy, because truth can be pretty ugly when you see it. So damn much money. The Triumph of Lobbying and the Corrosion of American Government. Written by Robert G. Kayser. And yes, it's got me in a tizzy today. I'll read you the flap and give you a glimmer of the tip of the iceberg of information in here. The startling story of the monumental growth of lobbying in Washington, D.C. and how it undermines effective government and pollutes our politics. A true insider, Robert G. Kaiser, has monitored American politics for the Washington Post for nearly half a century. In this sometimes shocking and always riveting book, he explains how and why, over the last four decades, Washington has become a dysfunctional capital. At the heart of the, his story is money, money made by special interests, using campaign contributions and lobbyists to influence government decisions and money demanded by congressional candidates to pay for their increasingly expensive campaigns, which can cost a stag staggering sum. In 1974, the average winning campaign for the Senate cost 437000 By 2006, that number had grown to $7.92 million. The cost of winning House campaigns grew comparably 56,500 in 1974 to 1 1.3 million in 2006. Politicians need for money and the willingness, even eagerness, of special interests and lobbyists to provide it explain much of what has gone wrong in Washington. They have created a mutually beneficial, mutually reinforcing relationship between special interests and elected representatives and they have created a new class in Washington wealthy lobbyists whose careers often begin in public service. Kaiser shows us how behavior by public officials that was once considered corrupt or improper became commonplace how special interests became the principal funders of elections, and how our biggest national problems, health care, global warming, and the looming crises of Medicare and Social Security, among others, have been ignored as a result. Kaiser illuminates this progression through the saga of Gerald S. J. Cassidy, a J. Gatsby for modern Washington. Cassidy came to Washington in 1969 as an idealist young lawyer determined to help feed the hungry. Over the course of 30 years, he built one of the city's largest and most profitable lobbying firms and accumulated a personal fortune of more than $100 million. Cassidy's story provides an unprecedented view of lobbying from within the belly of the beast. A timely and tremendously important book that finally explains how Washington really works today and why it works so badly. And there's one more point I wanted to share with you in here that really caught my attention. <clears throat> Starting on page 356. So I get back up on the hill and I have a few people I've started to rely on, wise old heads. And I say, I have a feeling that I should report this to the authorities. Who should I report this to? And they looked at me like I was nuts. They said, that's the way Washington works. That's the way you get money here. Everybody does it. And what I soon found out was, everybody did it. I mean, the best people. All the people you know and love. Who were big in town at the time. That's how they got money. <clears throat> Brown paper bags and cash and whatnot. Rothstein, who later built on the lessons he learned from Napoleon, 
to become a successful political consultant himself, told this story to discourage the belief that there had been once been a period of pristine American politics untainted by money. There was no such time. Money has been a part of American politics forever, on occasion in the Gilded Age or the Harding administration. For example, much more blatantly than recently, but there was one important qualitative difference, as Ross Stein acknowledged in recent decades. The scale of it has just gotten way out of hand. The money may have come in brown paper bags in earlier eras, but the politicians needed and took much less of it than, than they take through more formal channels today. Fred Westenheimer had been an agitator for reforms to reduce the influence of money in Washington for more than three decades. Wertheimer is a lobbyist himself, but for a non-paying client, his vision of a cleaner American government. Westheimer noted that since the Nixon era, Congress itself has removed many egregious forms of corruption, cast contributions to politicians like the bag full of money that Ross Stein collected for Mike Gravel, which once were as common as Capitol Hill spittoons, direct employment of members of the House and Senate as lawyers or advisors, for example, by corporations, also common until the 1970s, cash for speeches that went directly into members' pockets, the honoraria, unregulated soft money contributions from individuals, unions, and corporations that largely funded the 1996 and 2000 elections, banned in 2002. Wertheimer, who had the optimism required of anyone engaged in a long-term crusade to improve human behavior, noted proudly that the Senate's decision to accept a two-year cooling-off period in 2007 when the House rejected it. He was pleased that earmarks were being debated seriously for the first time in decades. He also took heart from the provisions of the 2007 reforms that banned nearly all forms of gifts from lobbyists and lobbying organizations to members from dinner at a Washington restaurant to a golfing vacation in Scotland. The biggest change made by the new rule is a cultural one, making members pay their own way as opposed to their traditional view that they were entitled to trips, meals, etc., paid for by others, he said. If the culture of freebies could be altered, Westheimer, Wertheimer argued, so could other delirious aspects of the Washington political culture. Not that Wertheimer was satisfied. We still haven't solved the problem of campaign money. Another optimist was Bill Bradley. Significant change in the culture of politics might require a revolution. But why rule out the possibility of a revolution, especially when the country was so fed up? The current approval rating of Congress has never been lower, he said, only a slight exaggeration when he spoke near the end of 2007. The only way this is going to change is with popular uprising. I believe you can catalyze this latent revolution and you can direct it. And perhaps that is the answer. Robert G. Kaiser with the Washington Post since 1963 has covered Congress, the White House, and national politics reported from abroad as the Post correspondent in Saigon and Moscow, served as the paper's national editor and managing editor, and is now associate editor and senior correspondent. He has written for Esquire, Foreign Affairs, and the New York Review of Books, and is the author or co-author of six books, including Russia, The People, and The Power. He has received awards from both the Overseas Press Club and the National Press Club. He lives in the town where he was born in Washington, D.C. And I thank you very much, Mr. Kaiser, and thumbs up on a great book full of info that we need. God bless you and all the good people out there. You have a great one, day or night, wherever you're at. Later.